mass exodus of children here. <laughs> well, there goes the next generation of ministers and evangelists and missionaries and defenders of the faith. There they go to get their education. Praise the Lord. Dear saints, we are going to be back in the book of Job. And I think that we're going to be very encouraged even looking at Job. We're going to be in Job chapter 12 this morning. Can you locate Job 12? Just as a quick um, review from last week, remember last week was a little bit of a creation seminar here. Job reminds us that the created order testifies to the existence of a creator, a very, very intelligent and very, very powerful creator, to say the least. And we reflected on this a little bit, and, and we were reminded that the creator of the world is actually the last Adam. You remember who the first Adam was? Our, our, our original progenitor, our federal head and representative, original man Adam. He represented us, and when he fell, we fell. We fell in Adam. But the creator of the world took a human nature. That's the Lord Jesus. He's called the last Adam, a new representative, a new spiritual progenitor. And aren't you glad for that? Some people say, well, wh why do I get blamed for what Adam did? I wasn't there. I had nothing to do with it. Well, first of all, I think you were there spiritually, mysteriously, embryonically. We were in Adam when he fell. You can consult Hebrews, the seventh chapter, for more on that. But aren't you glad that Jesus came and he by himself purged our sins? And he willingly represents you before his Father in the third heaven. If only you will come into a love-trust relationship with God by him, by Jesus. It's the greatest offer that's ever been made, friends. And it's today that is the time of salvation. Today, not you don't wait. You receive Jesus today and let him start your life new. Well, Job wants us to know that the created order doesn't just testify of a creator, but it testifies to the existence of an upholder and sustainer. It's one thing to say, well, the universe came into being a finite time ago, and it did. It looks like that. All the scientific and philosophical evidence points to a cosmic origin. Therefore, the universe must have a cause, and we say the cause of the universe is the eternal triune God of the Bible. But there's something else to think about, and it's this. What on earth is holding the world together moment by moment? This is the argument from existential causality. Or you could just ask yourself, in English, why does the universe continue to exist? You ever think about that one? It's quite distinct from what brought it into being in the first place. What's holding it in being? And Colossians 1.17 tells you that in Jesus Christ, all things consist. Literally, in Christ, all things are held together. All things are held together. And that includes, and I don't want to get too philosophical here, friends, but it's not just the the material world that's being held together, but your soul spirit with your material body are being held in relationship by God, and all your propositions are being held together in their arguments, and mathematical truths are being held together by God. He holds it all together. Literally, there is no autonomy, friends. There's nothing in the created order that God doesn't know about, isn't touching, isn't identifying, isn't providing for. God touches all of it. There is no dark corner of the universe that God doesn't have access to. And that includes our minds and hearts, too. He has access to the innermost being of you and I. And I say, if we want God to, to save us, body, soul, and spirit, then give it all to Him and hold nothing back. Surrender it all to Jesus for His tender ministry. But look at this dependence on God. Look at Job chapter 12, verse 9. Job asks his friends, Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Does not the ear test words and the mouth taste its food? Wisdom is with aged men and with length of days understanding. Look at those terms he uses there in uh, that little verse passage we read. Every, he says, all, no autonomy, no independent existence. God holds everything together, moment by moment. In fact, 
the great prophet Isaiah will echo these exact same truths in the 42nd chapter of his prophecy. The great prophet Isaiah says that the creator of the heavens and the earth is the one who gives life and breath to those who dwell on the earth. And none other than the great apostle Paul, living, you know, 700 years after Isaiah, would use just those Bible truths when he was interacting with the so-called intelligentsia there in Athens in Acts chapter 17. Now, Paul doesn't say to those Athenian philosophers, now, gentlemen, I'm quoting from the great prophet Isaiah now in the, second cha or the 42nd chapter, because these men have no clue who Isaiah is. Nevertheless, Paul is absolutely unashamed of his... Christian foundations, his Judeo-Christian roots religiously, and everything that came out of Paul's mouth in that encounter with the Athenians was absolutely countercultural and would have been horribly offensive to these people. But he said to them that it's God, the God of heaven, the Christian God, the, the Hebrew God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is the one who gives life and breath and all things, including your identity, that comes from God too, and in God we live and move and have our being. And, of course, Paul would go on to those Athenians and he would say, as a matter of fact, God is made of one blood, all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. That would have been very offensive. To those Athenians, it's, they're the Greeks. They're above every other people group. You're either a Greek or you're a barbarian. And Paul said, oh, no, <laughs> we're all in this together. We, we all trace our ancestry back through Noah up all the way to Adam, original man Adam. And guess what? That makes us all savable. Jesus Christ came into the world to save the sons of Adam, and that's all of us. But look at, this, look at verse 11 again here. Does not the ear te test words and the mouth taste its food? And then he tells us that wisdom is with the aged. Well, you, you eat your food, and you can sort of tell, can't you, if it's good or if it's wholesome or nutritious or if it's bad, rotten, synthetic, and, and harmful. I can't resist telling this short story. One, one day when I was working in the in aerospace on the machine shop floor. I had to get up extra early and you, you kind of stagger around the house and you go to the fridge and get your lunch and go to work. And one day I took the old spaghetti, not the leftovers from the night before. I took the stuff way at the back of the fridge. I ate that and I thought, this tastes a little strange. I wonder if my wife put cheese on it for me. <laughs> <laughs> And I called Lindy at lunchtime. I said, uh, how are you doing, love? And she said, well, why didn't you take the spaghetti? I said, well, I did. She said, no, you took that stuff from three weeks ago. <laughs> I said, don't laugh, dear. I'm a ticking time bomb. <laughs> but, but praise the Lord, nothing bad happened. So, but I could tell my, my sense of taste was, I could tell something was not right about that food there. It wasn't good. And Job says that our ears test words the same way. The mind tastes truth. You've been programmed by God to apprehend, appreciate, communicate truth. We're brought into the world to do those things. So your ear tests the words. Are they true? Are they good words? Are they helpful? Or are they bad, false, hurtful, or harmful? What are we dealing with here? But God wants us to know, friends, this is very important, that even these rational and cognitive faculties that we exercise every single day were given to us by God. That's important that we understand that. In Proverbs 20 and verse 12, the writer there says that the, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. And that's the very reason, friends, why you trust them. Our minds and senses are generally reliable. We live in a fallen world, so they're not uh, perfect. They're, they sometimes, sometimes our senses deceive us. But they're generally reliable. They generally get us in contact with the truth, and so we generally trust them just because we know that God gave them to us for that purpose. And I'd like to ask the atheist the question, why are you trusting your minds and senses? You don't believe your eyes are here so that you can see. You think your eyes are here on accident. Why do you trust them? Your mind, you treat your mind like it's here so that you can reason and, co and, and come down to true conclusions on things, but why are you even doing that? On your worldview as an atheist, your mind is here by accident. It wasn't really designed to do that, and yet you trust it. Because deep down, everybody knows that God made us, you know. Everybody knows 
that our ears are here so that we can see, or so that we can hear rather, our eyes so that we can see, our minds so that we can think properly. That's how we treat these things. And that just gives evidence of the fact that we all deep down know that God is real. And the great offense, of course, to God is that we don't give him the credit. We don't glorify him. We don't thank him for giving us these things. That's the problem. And I can read now from the 94th Psalm and verse 8. This is what the psalmist says. This is a challenge to the peoples of the earth. Understand, you senseless among the people, and you fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? He who instructs the nations, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge? The Lord knows that the thoughts of, he knows the thoughts of man, that they are futile. They are vain. They're useless. Unaided human reason, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. Unaided human reason without any recourse to God, without any acknowledgement of God, is foolish. It's futile. It collapses into arbitrariness and foolishness. And this is what the Bible wants us to know so that we're continually looking to God for wisdom and help and guidance. And God doesn't deceive his people. He doesn't lie to people. He'll put you in the right direction. He'll guard you and order your thinking aright. In Psalm 51 and verse 6, there David says that, of God now. He says, God, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. So how is it that man is able to reason properly and think logically? Because God has programmed you with all the things that are necessary for you to do that. In Job 38 and 36, we're told that God has put wisdom in the mind and understanding in the heart. You know, friends, Job wants us to know that the created order testifies to the power and wisdom of God, and among all of God's creatures, surely man is exhibit A in this little display. Surely man must be that. We have been endowed by God, our, created, our creator, uh, the one whose image we bear. He has given us amazing abilities, capacities, and attributes that no, no animal has or ever will. We can reason together. God says, let us reason together. Remember Isaiah 118? Come, let us reason together. We can think, and while you're thinking about something, you can think about the fact that you're thinking. You ever think about that? <laughs> A good friend of mine years ago, it hit him like a ton of bricks. He, he came to see me. He said, I was really thinking hard about a problem, and then it hit me. I would not be able to do this if God didn't exist and provide for this. It hit him. God enlightened his heart and mind to the fact. And he said, the moment it hit me, John, I grew very terrified because God was contacting me. God was in direct contact with me at that moment, helping me think and then enlighten, enlightening my mind and heart to the fact that it was he who was doing it. And that's what's happening right now, even moment by moment here, even in the sanctuary here, as you're listening to my words and trying to process, God is here in the spirit helping you he is getting your thoughts right, getting your heart right. Isn't that amazing? He's not far from any one of us, the Bible says. He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Isn't that amazing? And, he, and to boot, Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out, said the Savior. The world is fickle, shallow, nitpicky, trivial, petty. Not God. God makes promises. He keeps them. He started a good work in you. He's going to perform it. He won't drop you halfway, friends. He'll take you all the way to the shores of a blessed new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness forever. He promised, and he who promised is faithful. And he's the reason why we come here. We're going to honor him and go to his word and praise him for the things that he shows us here. You and I can engage in a little something called rational inquiry, can't we? We can determine what's to be accepted, what's to be rejected when we're hit with truth claims. We can decide, well, how are we going to do this in accordance with a standard, a knowable standard called the Bible? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I think it's verse 21, where Paul says, you're to test all things, hold fast that which is good. How are you going to test all things with a known standard called the Bible? And it'll tell you what's, what's true in the world and what's false, what's deception, what's lies, and what's wholesome, noble, upright, and good. The Bible will tell us. It's the lens through which we see the world. You know what the tragedy here is, friends, in the world? The tragedy is that growing numbers of people just refuse to acknowledge God as the giver of these good things. 
None of us really are worthy of the least of God's mercies. And yet what stupendous grace and goodness and privileges and responsibilities has God showered on us? Promises, precious promises made to us. People, just normal people. God says, in, in my economy, you matter to me. That's what God says. If we, if we didn't, he never would have come into the world in the person of his son Jesus and hung on a cross for six hours to pay our sin debt in full. We matter to him. What a shame for most of the world, God doesn't matter much to them, even though he displays goodness and mercy moment by moment to these people. Well, I want to zero in here for just a little bit, friends, at verse 12, because I, I think this is very important. This is, again, very countercultural, but this is biblical. Verse 12, wisdom is with aged men and with length of days is understanding. Now, I know that there are lots of exceptions to this rule. There's, there's many exceptions to many rules. But as a general principle, as a general truth, a guideline, a rule of thumb, when you see gray hair on somebody, as a rule, that person has some wisdom that they've learned over the years, including life, I mean, real life experience and real practical wisdom. They, they know how to problem solve. They've experienced things, hard things. They can offer you a word of comfort because they've probably passed through a hard thing that you maybe just now are passing through. And they can give you some practical instruction on how to get through it. And it's a bit of a shame in the Western world that many young people see the older folks as outmoded, their thinking is obsolete or not relevant to today's problems and so on, not applicable. But I want to say, friends, that in terms of intrinsic brilliance, in terms of those character traits that are needful to keep a community upright, healthy, strong, productive, the, the character traits that are needful to keep a community, the kind of community you want to live in and I want to live in, it seems to me that the former generations have us beat hands down. We are getting more and more guttural, less and less thoughtful, less and less kind, less and less tolerant, really tolerant, using the word properly here, less and less human we're becoming more and more brutish. We are not nicer to each other in the year 2021. There's less awareness that we are God's image bearers and that we have intrinsic value and dignity. Our secular culture that has supersaturated the Western world looks at us as just another piece of nature. We may as well be ants or rats or broccoli or something. And there's less and less dignity being attributed to man, being recognized in man. And that's a problem. Former generations had less than we do. And yet they had to learn to be content. You ever talk to somebody who's been through the Depression? Or read the writings of people who have been through the Depression? Or the First or Second World War? They had to be content. They had to be innovative. They had to be creative. They had to be frugal and less wasteful. They had to do those things. They knew how to recycle, reduce, repurpose, reuse. They knew how to do that better than we do. Oh, we're, we're, we have a recycling bin. We put plastic bottles in the recycling bin. You think that's doing anything? I have deep suspicions this is a waste of time and resources. In the old days, they had glass bottles. Wash them out, use them again. Not go through go a big recycling plant, wasting all kinds of energy. That this is a little something that the, the ancients knew, friends. You know what it's called? It's called simplified productivity. They could get done what needed to get done, and they used their intrinsic brilliance to do it, to problem solve. And they knew how to share, because no one had a whole lot. They shared with each other. And it was voluntary, right? It's not some leftist socialist regime forcibly confiscating your hard-earned money and giving it to the people they think ought to have it. No, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a compassionate capitalism where people didn't have a whole lot, but they saw others who had less, and they voluntarily, as a reflection of the goodness in their hearts, put there by God to be sure, they would share. And they learned how to do that. And these people were patient, more patient than we are in this generation, because back then everything was analog, everything was manual. 
you had to wait to get something done. Nowadays, it's push a button. You push a button on some cheap plastic something that's going to break down in six months, and out pops the thing you want. And the digital age, I think it's a curse. I really do. I don't think things are better because we hook up to a computer. I think that the, the world has been hypnotized into thinking that as long as you go digital, you're progressing. I think books and ledgers are pr pretty progressive than putting everything on magnetically striped disks. Very fragile. That's just my opinion there. But these people learned how to be patient because everything took longer. And guess what else? There's no social media garbage. There's no Twitter and TikTok and this, that, and the other dumb thing that's coming down the pike. These people had to interact. They had to interact. You go to a, go to a store and you talk to a clerk and the clerk is pleasant. Paper or plastic, sir? Who's ever heard that lately? They knew how to interact. They don't just stare at a phone and not know what a real human, actual breathing person looked like, how to deal with them. And that's not every, now I'm not coming against every young person either now, don't get me wrong. There are still young people who know how to interact. For them, it's important to establish relationship and learn how to talk to people and listen. But you see, friends, the ancients, former generations, even people who lived at the beginning of the 20th century, less tech equals more brain power. And I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you this. My, my technical skills in math are very poor. I like philosophy of math. I could talk about philosophy of math. But to actually sit down and do some mathematical operations, I'm terrible. That's probably my fault, most of that, but it's so easy to pull out our calculator. It's right there. We have lots of math in our home. We have to calculate grams to how much insulin Marcus is going to get. And uh, if it's anything beyond that, I mean, I need a calculator. And I use a calculator for that most times. And it bothers me, friends, that there is a realm of truth. There's a realm of mathematical truth out there inaccessible to me now. I need this little device here to help me get to that realm. My mind does not have direct contact with it. But the older generations did. They had direct access in their, with their God-given minds and senses. They could get in contact with truth that seems further and further removed from us. And they had a greater attention span too, the ancients. Even people at the beginning of the 20th century. Greater attention span. Did you know that there'd be presidential debates down south that would go all day long, the whole day? As late as 1982, I watched a creation debate. Each debater gets one hour opening statement. One hour. Two hours before they even get to the rebuttals and the cross-examinations, and people could sit and listen to it and comprehend. And they weren't getting all fidgety. They, they, they were listening. They could take it in. The greater attention span. Why? Because there's more reading going on. That's why. When you read, you have to work. And you get good at what you do, friends. And God in his wisdom gave us a Bible to read. And former generations read books. They read books. And they had to engage with the book. And you know what we're doing today? We're looking at images. Lots and lots of images. Dumb little videos of cats doing stuff or whatever. <laughs> and you know what, friends? There's nothing wrong with giving your mind a rest and laughing. It's okay to give your mind a rest and laugh. But I'm afraid that our generation, or the generation coming up, is doing far too much of it. And it's not good for the mind. The attention span is becoming less and less. The tolerance is less and less. The patience is less and less. What, the, what our former generations knew, how they behaved, the character traits they displayed made for a better way of life. It's never been perfect, not even in the Western world. It's never been perfect. We always had violent crime. We always had political corruption. We always had gangs and gangsters. We always had problems. But when I talk to people who lived through the Depression and they tell us that everybody was dirt poor, but if you had money to afford a milkman, you could put the empty bottles on the step and pin the money to the little rack there that held the bottle and no one in the neighborhood would steal that money and everybody's poor. That tells me something was different in their hearts back then. It's not poverty that's creating all the crime and all the violence. 
and all the social ills that's going on around here. It's jettisoning God from our thinking. It's getting rid of God. It's ignoring Him and looking at the world differently. That's the big problem here. We need to get back to the, to the ways of the days of old. I think we need to go back. It's the most progressive thing you could possibly do. Go back. Go back to where you got off the track. That is the most progressive thing. Well, the enemy knows. So the enemy has created something in our society called what? Do you know this term? Cancel culture. Anyone ever hear of that? Let's cancel it. The enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy. So he says, let's cancel, let's cancel history. We're going to rewrite history. And men that we thought were heroes, we're going to make them villains. And we're going to create all sorts of confusion with respect to our own country's history. And there's going to be less and less to bind us together. And it's going to make for a terrible way of life. And God is ignored in all of it. And that's a problem. Because God had a very big part to play in the founding of our country. And that's all being ignored and forgotten. Listen to the older folks, friends, especially the older folks who have been in the Lord for a long time. You can ask them. I remember reading an article one time. They asked older folks in their 90s. They could see death on the horizon. It's coming. They asked them, what kind of mistakes have you made? What do you regret? What do you want to tell the next generations coming up? What do you regret? What would you do differently? Two things dominated their responses. First, I wish I would have taken more chances, they say. When I was young, healthy, and strong, and I had some freedom, I wish I would have taken more chances. And secondly, I wished I would have focused on the right things. I wish I would have had my priorities straight. Now I'm on my deathbed. I see what I've done wrong. If only I could go back and do it again. You know what, friends? That's not us. We're, we're still here. You walked in here on your own power. You can... You and I can do something different tomorrow. We can get our priorities straight tomorrow if we haven't. We can take some chances tomorrow for Christ's glory, for his honor and the good of those that he loves. And you talk to old people who have been walking with Jesus for a long, long time, and it won't be very long before they direct your thinking off of them and on to the one who is much older than themselves, in fact, the Bible calls him the Ancient of Days, and that's God the Father. They'll direct you to the Ancient of Days, God himself, and to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is identified in Micah 5 as the one whose goings forth are from old, even from everlasting. And when Christ the Lord was walking the earth in the days of his earthly ministry, he identified himself to his astonished so-called religious leaders, his audience, the, the leaders, he identified himself. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to stone him. The older folks, they know. that it, the, Those that have been walking with Jesus for a long time, those with the gray hair, they'll direct your thinking to Jesus, the ancient of days, to Jesus, his beloved son, the one in whom are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2, 3. And Ephesians 4.21 reminds us that the truth is in Jesus. In Colossians 2.10, Paul reminds all of us, friends, that you are complete in Him who is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. You are, you are seated with Him, and you're complete in Him, too. And you needn't go any further, and you shouldn't go any further. He is all we'll ever need, friends. All we'll ever need is in Christ. Well, I'm just going to trust the Lord that that's sufficient for this morning and that it's been an encouraging morning for you. I'm just going to close us off with a word of prayer and then we have a final song from our gifted worship team. Dear blessed Holy God, we just come into your presence with grateful hearts today. We thank you, Lord, for, for adjusting our thinking this morning to one extent or other. You've reminded us of things that maybe we forgot. You've helped us this morning to get our priorities straight, get them in line with your word, your, your heart's position on the matter expressed here in the Bible for us. We thank you for your presence here among us today, dear God, in the person of the Holy Spirit. And I pray in Jesus' name for every person that's assembled here under this roof today. There are no accidents. There's no such thing as chance. 
In your providential care, you've drawn people here today, O oh God, for their edification, for their good, and for our good also. So I pray in Jesus' name that every person that's come here will be built up and encouraged in the Christian faith, that they'll be encouraged to open the Bible, and that they will see wondrous things in the Bible that will thrill their hearts and give them strength for the day. Lord, may all of us walk in the good works you've prepared beforehand for us to walk in, and may we be exceeding fruitful in the ministries you've entrusted to each and every one of us, individually, as homes and families, and as an extended church family also. May these things be so, O oh God, for your glory, for the good of your people, and for the good of those who don't yet know you in a saving way. We commit it all to your care, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.